This is Kevin Harrington, original shark from Shark Tank, inventor of the infomercial, and you're listening to Jamie Beckler from Success is a Choice. Thank you. Providing insights to help you grow your business, improve yourself, and add value to those around you. You're listening to the Success is a Choice podcast, where you get a peek into the lives of industry leaders as they share their stories with you. Welcome to Success is a Choice podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Beckler, and today's guest is someone that is definitely on the ball. Steve Nudelberg is a sales trainer and consultant who founded a company called On The Ball. The company invests time and talent in emerging businesses and corporate teams to help them grow. Steve is also the author of Confessions of a Serial Salesman. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to uh, spend the time with you. I love love some of the stuff you're doing and looking forward to sharing my thoughts. Hey, I appreciate it, Steve. Now, now our, uh, our show is called Success is a Choice, so I'd love to get your definition and, of success and kind of how you measure success throughout your career and, and as you look to the future. Uh, great, great opening question. You know, I, I think um, I'm a student of, of life and, and of the, you know, the game of life, and I think everything is a choice. And so from, you know, when I was very young to, uh, you know, right up to the current day, um, I wake up every morning knowing that my attitude will affect the results. And so, um, I, you know, I think the idea that um, I can actually uh, determine my success by my attitude, by my choices, all those kind of things. Um, and it's all about my habits, which is my book was written specifically about these 27 rules that I put together that in my world, in my son's world, in all of the people that I work with and train, I believe that these 27 habits are things that leaders and influencers do on a regular basis that actually dictate their success. Well, you said you wake up and you, and you have a choice what you do. Well, the, the very first chapter in your book is wake up early, the very first principle. Um, so you're, you're starting off your day when you wake up early, uh, choosing whether you're going to be successful or not. You know, it's really funny. The, uh, the, the word early is somewhat nebulous in, in that it means different things to different people. Um, the studying that I've done uh, dictates for me that I get up every day just about 3 or 3.30 and people go, oh my God, that's crazy. Well, for most people, their world, and I, you know, we do the studies and when I speak, I have people raise their hand, they get up at 7 or 6.30 and some people get up at 5. Even if we were to use 5 as an example, well, I generally am going to get up two hours earlier every single day and so I may not be the smartest, I may not be the best looking, although my wife would tell you different. Um, I know for a fact I'm going to be first, and there's always that mentality. Um, Jocko Willenick, if you follow him, he's one of the uh, Navy SEALs who speaks about get after it right from the beginning, get up, shake out the cobwebs, and go for it. And that's what I do every single day so that I get the most out of every day. And it starts with that, you know, how you wake up and what, what's in your brain. Well, there's a guy that I follow that's, uh, that's big into training NBA players. His name is Drew Hanlon. And one of the things that he always talked about was he would get up at 4.50 every day, not five because he wanted to be earlier than the guys that thought that they were getting up at five. So that was just a, that was just a little different of a mindset shift. Uh, and so you, you use a word that is so fantastic. It's all about mindset and what you bring to the party. How do you want to show up every single day? People who are successful will tell you they wake up early. They do diff things that are different. As I told you, we're working on a project with John Sally and with Jerry Rice. And one of the things that Jerry Rice said is like, I was willing to do the things that everybody else wasn't willing to do. So you, it can be very simple, but simple is not easy. Simple is uh, paying attention to details and being consistent with small behavioral things on a regular basis. Yeah, well, Jerry Rice, you mentioned him, and he's a great example because he was essentially a nobody coming out of Mississippi Valley State. Nobody knew of him. Nobody thought much of him, and he ends up being the, the greatest wide receiver in NFL history, possibly the greatest football player in NFL history. So talk, talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned that project. Talk about some of the projects you've got going on. So the, the core part of my business, and I think what makes uh, the, the things that we do unique 
I am a sales guy. I am that guy that builds relationships on a daily basis and have done it for 40 years. And so my network produces my net worth. And I think that's really significant that right from the beginning, I made one sale to just about everybody that I meet, and that sale is me. And so we're involved in large and small business development projects, things where people come to us and say, hey, you know, we've got this idea, we've got this business, we've got something going on, and we need somebody with a sales mind and a sales focus to help us get over the ladder. So, you know, we can name something, we can package it, we can distribute it. All of those things that a sales, you know, VP of sales theoretically would do, those are the skill sets that, you know, myself and my team bring to the table. And it wasn't until recently that we started training and speaking about it because we do have a different way. We do not do cookie cutter trainings. We figure out how would we sell something and then reverse engineer it and come up with all of the messaging, all the behavior and all the things. But I can tell you this, that every single thing starts with that initial conversation, that's the number one sale and where most people fail to realize the power in relationships, uh, the who you know is much more valuable than what you know. Well, you, uh, on the back of your book, uh, your, your book, Confessions of a Serial Salesman, and we'll, we'll definitely be putting this link into uh, the show notes so people can check that out. But I, I want to read the back of the book for the, for the audience at home. It says, this sure. is a book. This is a book that everybody need or everyone needs. Everyone needs it because selling is about relationships. And no matter who you are, you need to know how to sell. Even if you say you don't like sales, you're selling every day. You are an influencer. Uh, you you either are good at being influential and getting people to gravitate you to you or not. Man, that's that's different. Most people most people sales is just about sell 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 tell 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 you know, tell about their product, but you're talking about relationships and a different way to influence. You know, so I, I'm super proud of the work. Uh, the foreword was written by my son, who is 31 years old and a, a rising college football coach. He lived these rules growing up. And so it's really, really special for me to see the product of all of the people that I know who use this. And the reality is, is that you are, you have to get noticed. And the world is not a transactional world anymore. People are going to get run over. People don't buy the name on the door. They buy you first. They make a decision on you. And think about just about any product or service you can buy. If you don't like the person who's delivering the message to you, you will shut it down and find somebody that you do like. So the power of understanding relationship building, number one. And number two is knowing that you don't have to be liked by everybody. The best part about what I do and how we bring this to market is that we go about aligning with the people we're supposed to be aligned with. Not everybody's going to like me. I'm okay with that. That's not the nature of the game. Great baseball players get up and out of every 10 times, they fail seven out of every 10 times and they make millions of dollars and they're the best in the world. For me, I want to find the few that I align with and smother them with attention and build friendships and deep relationships with them because they become a representation of me to the marketplace. And so for me, I have built a network of people that on a regular basis, when they hear in their world, when they hear somebody talking about sales or some sales functionality, some problem, they go, wow, you should talk to Noodleberg because I have an opinion. I've developed that thought leadership. And that only comes from developing strong, powerful relationships with, oh, by the way, it's so fruitful for my life. There's, you know, every city I go to and I travel extension, uh, extensively, I have real friends, real people that I care about, care about me and help me tell my story, you know, and validate my story. So I think it's, you know, the, I, the, the prize for me was the quality of the relationships and then the transactions come second. And that is so foreign to many companies that spend millions of dollars in product and service training, but don't actually talk about, well, what do you say to somebody in the room that has nothing to do with the sale? 
Well, I like your uh, phrase you use, transactional, that, that most salesmen are transactional and not transformational, and, and they're, not, uh, they're not building those relationships. So, uh, you know, if the, if the sale doesn't go through, then almost there's no relationship. It, it's like people, people tend to, uh, if there's no sale, then, then you don't mean anything to me or, or we can't have any kind of relationship. And, and you're essentially saying that that's not true, that you can continue to build relationships and you can continue to, um, have influence on people, even if you're not making a transaction at that point. So inc- incredibly on point to such a degree that this past week on my podcast, I had a CEO that I met 10 years ago when he was starting his business at the uh, Florida State University in Tallahassee, and it's 10 years later, he's built a tremendous business, and because I remained friends with him six months ago, they were at a point where they've experienced tremendous growth, they acquired two other companies, they did not have the internal sales skill sets to manage what was happening within their company. And he said, aha, I know somebody who does because we've been friends all this time. And he called me up and we've been involved with that company. And I am fully confident that I will be involved in his company now till, you you know, the, for the distant, the near future, because we're a great fit. We already know each other. We already like each other. We already trust each other. And I have a value proposition that I can come in and influence the direction of the sales team. And in that six months, we have pure metrics that prove it out. But it's more than metrics. It's culture. It's fun. It's social. It's so, so great. And so he pointed out on the podcast that most people 10 years ago would have said, oh, there's no money for me to make here. I'm moving on. And that clearly was not what happened because I value him as a friend and now look what happened. So, you know, it's, it's easier said than done. Um, but it's a commitment that I think salespeople are going to get rudely awakened if they haven't already done that because social media puts it all out in front of people's faces, who you are, what you are, what makes you tick. And this whole concept of no like, and trust is so, so significant in a commoditized world that that really becomes the only differentiating point that people buy on. And oh, by the way, they'll spend more for it. So it's, it's really fascinating. So if you're a salesman out there uh, and you're only calling on somebody or only getting in touch with someone when you want to sell them something you think they need, then don't be surprised when you're banging your head against the wall trying to make a sale. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so funny. One of the questions we ask sales teams when we get started, we go, do us a favor and write down the definition of what you think a good meeting is. And in- inevitably, everybody goes to well, I'm dealing with the decision maker, they have enough money, they have a need, and I go, those are all maybe good things, but the overriding thing for me and how we train people is, did you connect with that person? Because you can't fake that connection. Did you feel good about them? Did they feel good about you? Because I will tell you that if you do that on a regular business, on a regular basis, and build five to eight quality relationships every day, if you do that over a consistent period of time, call it 90 days, just do the math. I mean, the the numbers are astounding about how many relationships you will have developed, and there's no doubt that your business will explode. It's the ones who keep banging on a door going, oh, you're not ready to buy, I'm moving on, who, you know, really, and that's one of the reasons why there's such high turnover in all sales departments is that there's this pressure to transact instead of really build a foundation that lasts a long time. And I'm not saying that companies don't do it. When they do, I absolutely adore and embrace those that are building their businesses that way. Well, and even like you said on the back of your book, even if you don't like sales, we're all selling something. And uh, businessman Harvey McKay, he wrote a book that said, dig your well before you're thirsty. So even those of us that aren't in quote unquote sales, we're going to need something from someone one day. And the only time they hear from us is when we need that. We may not get the answer we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing when I when I talk to, you know, sales teams, I go, when was the last time you reached out to an existing client? just to say, hey, how you doing? What's going on in your business? 
I know it's your birthday. I know it's your anniversary. Your kid graduated. If all, to your point, if all of the, the, the interactions are about business, you've set the tone that you don't really care about them. It's so much easier to just care and take that extra effort. People notice it and they tell other people about it. And so you wind up building a reputation that, wow, they make me feel good, which at the end of the day, that's what sales is all about is how you impress, you know, how you influence people is based on how you make them feel. We'll rejoin our conversation with Steve in just a moment. You know, whether you're an actual salesperson, a teacher, a coach, a business person, maybe you're an author, well, you might want a website. Our friends at HostGator.com are offering our listeners up to 50% off the regular price for website services. Just use promo code SUCCESS. I use HostGator.com for all of my websites, and they've been easy to work with and inexpensive. And now, back to our interview with Steve Noodleberg. Well, you've uh, spoken in front of thousands of people. You've made money. You've got books. You, you're dealing with you know, high-level entertainers, athletes, but I'm sure not everything has gone smoothly in your life. What would, be a, what would be a favorite failure that you've had? What's something that you've overcome that kind of helped you moving forward? So I, I, really, I really like that question and admire it because I think the, the sales, the people who have been the most successful in sales, sales professionals who have achieved you know, quality success in their life have all dealt with fear and doubt and failure. And so the biggest learnings come from failure. And so to me, I have learned to embrace failure as opportunity kicking me in the stomach. But to your point, every sales professional has had one of those stories that they tell every holiday going, wow, this one was a doozy. And I will leave the names out. But for me, I had the opportunity to uh, represent one of the build uh, the uh, stadiums here in South Florida where I live. And we had the opportunity to create a naming rights partner for them and actually found the partner. Uh, the, the way the deal was constructed, we were given a 90-day window to do it prior to putting it out to the whole country, which was, you know, we had earned that opportunity. It was great. We were excited. We wound up finding a naming rights partner. Everything was agreed to. Money was agreed to. And I was actually visiting the client in their home office the team representatives were going to come out the following day and that night I was having dinner with them and just one of those things you never forget. I have, you know, the vision and I'm watching the movie again. The two cars are going to dinner. Everybody's excited about this great, you know, marketing opportunity that we've created and I got a phone call that they decided to go with a different partner and, you know, got off the phone and, you know, looked at everybody in the car and they go, what's the matter? And I go, the deal's not happening. And they were like, oh, quit fooling around. You're such a jokester. I go, I wish I was joking. Uh, this is a major, major setback. And it was one of those things that flashed in front of me that could have made the whole opportunity about me, poor me, you know, wah, 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 or understand that it wasn't about me and that there was something that didn't fit and that this client still was willing to spend the money to do that and I needed to find them another opportunity. Now, it's easy for me to say that now in retrospect, but I will tell you that when we got to the restaurant, there were two beautiful shots of tequila that changed my mind. <laughs> so um, it, it is not for the faint of heart. Being in a rejection-laced business, you have to really learn to expect it. And the rules that I put together were my armor. Football players put on pads and a helmet. You know, every sport, every business has its, what, what's the armor you're going to use? For me, the rules keep me protected from wallowing in defeat. And, you know, I, I like yourself being a coach, you're coaching people. You can't worry about a loss the next night when you go out to play because you've already you'll already been have been defeated so something i learned from coach saban was the word win is not win like wins and loss it's worry about what's important now 
what what's important what can i do right now and i use that as one of my foundational rules and when i tr train and, and even work with some coach some individual sales professionals they'll tell me oh you know six years ago if i had gotten that deal and if this would have happened and then this would have happened i'm you know wow you're stuck six ten years ago wake up that happened put it in a shelf learn from it and go forward and 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 the rules help me ground myself in what are the activities i need to be doing on a daily basis that get me the results i want not watching the scoreboard going hoping and praying i'm gonna score that big deal so i, I could go on the entire time telling you about failures nobody likes them but if you look at them as opportunity they do produce the greatest learnings well once again i i, I highly recommend this book and it's it's not uh it's not a real deep book from a like with all the research from a Harvard or, or something like that. It's an easy to read, very practical book, which is which is refreshing. And uh, things, you know, we already talked about wake up early and, and even the second rule. And we don't have time to go into all the rules, but the second rule is is practical. But one we don't think of and uh, that's make your bed. And and I just this summer, I got an, uh, a text message from a player that played for me about five years ago. And one of the things I would always tell our players was win the day. Like Chip Kelly, at, when he was at the University of Oregon, talked about win the day. But one of his things was make your bed. Win the day by starting off the day in a winning mindset. And, and she says, every time, every time I make my bed in the morning, I think about you telling us to make our bed every day. So, so isn't that awesome, the impression that you've made on, you know, on other people's minds? I was for years, I thought I was the crazy one, the one that was sort of OCD, that I had to get up and leave my room or my office for that matter in a very neat and professional manner. Come to find out years later, and this is in a wonderful, wonderful book uh, by Admiral McRaven, who was uh, the Admiral of the, of the Navy SEALs. And as I said, I study a lot. Here's these unbelievably trained human beings who protect us at the highest levels. And the first thing that happens to them every day is they get their bed inspected. And when he talked about it, it validated my thinking that you won the first thing. That was an activity and it's done. So many things in our life are not, they don't open and close. You open it and it takes a while to see where it goes. These are, boom, these are activities that say, wow, okay, here's something, I did it, I feel good about it, and then this was the, the killer for me. When you come home after a day that you've been beaten up, there's something about coming home to a bed that's made that actually makes you feel kind of okay, it's safe, it's great, it's, you know, it's organized, and it gives me hope that tomorrow will be better. And when, when you read his book or Google his name and, and see the... Uh, the uh, the speech that he did to the University of Texas, it's so spot on and it's so simple. It's not about major changes in behavior. It's the smallest changes in behavior that produce the re the greatest results. Well, yeah, and when we watch sports, we see a team win or lose, and and they didn't just happen to win and they didn't just happen to lose. A lot goes into that. And you talked about Saban, what's important now, you know, the win acronym. And you talk about making your bed and, and those little things, those are the little things that develop the habits. And, and you can't become a champion and become a winner if you're not doing those little things right. And, and that's what I love about the book, too. It, it just gives those, those little things and what we talked about earlier, that winning mindset, that different mindset, mindset shift. It's uh, so fascinating. The first six rules are really all about what happens in the morning. And candidly, there's a lot of good content all over the internet. There's a lot of great people pu pushing out stuff. So it's not novel. It's something I did, something that I wrote about, and I talk about stories about each of the rules. And there's some act, you know, action items that you know, and at pages afterward after each rule. But I've had people email me back and go, "Hey, this one didn't work for me, but I do this." And I go, "As long as you have a process." And what you tend to find out is winning teams and, and you know, successful individuals have a process. You know, the New England Patriots are not successful by accident. They have a process. They expect to win. They know how to deal with defeats. They were down 28-3 to Atlanta in the Super Bowl. 
they didn't go in the locker room freaking out. They just said, hey, we know how to do this. We have to stick to our process. We have to execute on the basics. And that's exactly what they did and exactly what Atlanta didn't do. And look at the results. So I don't think they were watching the scoreboard. They were looking at, we know how to run. We know how to throw. We know how to do all these things. And it was fascinating for me to watch because in that same year, in 2016, you've had Clemson was, you know, behind up until the last play of the game. You had the Cubs were down 3-1. You had the Cavaliers were down 3-1. And you had the Patriots. All four championship teams all never bought into what the scoreboard said. They just stuck to the mindset of, we know how to do this. We know how to win. Let's just control what we can control. And in the sales environment, this it's so critical because people get blown away by their internal emotions, by their fear and doubt. And it blows people away when I'm on stage and I go, I'm probably the one, one of the most fearful guys of all. I consistently win business and then go, what am I going to do? How are we going to do it? How is it going to come out? That doubt thing creeps into your brain. I think that there's a total of 70,000 thoughts that go through a human brain every day of which 30 to 40% of those are negative. You got to have something to control that. And most people don't. And so whether you're in sales or you're not in sales is really less relevant than, Hey, how am I dealing with this stuff? It's coming, whether you like it or not. You know, people who watch the news every day blows my mind. Why would you watch the news? Speaking of uh, speaking of small things that can add up to big things or, or have a, a lasting impact, uh, I love a question that Tim Ferriss asks of a lot of his guests, and he, and he says, "What's a purchase of a hundred dollars or less that's had a profound impact on your life?" Would you have an answer for that? I would. I, I would right instantly jumps to mind. Uh, many, many, many years ago, I spent, I think it might have been eight, fifteen dollars and I bought the book, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And what it showed me, and this was pre-social media, it showed me the power of who you know and that that actually can dictate your success and your and your net worth. So that that I, I use it over and over again. Your network will define your net worth. And it is so true. I live it every day. It's the, you know, I, I always wanted to be one of those centers of influence where I had an opinion and I was willing to share it. And that book is so strong. We still give it out on a regular basis. Uh, when we meet people and I train, you know, young staffs, I go, just read this and understand the power that the law of few turns into the law of many. And then obviously since Malcolm Gladwell has put on, you know, you know, has, has written great, great stuff. But I think those are small things that you do, small investments of time and money that produce tremendous results. And I, you know, I do speak about it in my own book. But it's, I like to tell people I'm an investor. I invest in myself. I want to learn every day. I want to, I recently took up boxing. And people are like, what, what, what are you doing, man? Why are you doing boxing? And number one is I love to watch it. And I didn't know how to do it. And I will tell you the skills, the mental skills I've learned from boxing far, far outweigh the physical skills. It is an un believable lesson of mind control and understanding your opponent and uh listen nobody likes to get punched in the face (laughs) (laughs) are you an mma guy or just boxing i'm not i I took up uh the the traditional boxing uh the you know so i have gloves um, my wife took it up at the same time. But to me, it was about learning something new, adding it to my repertoire, having something new to talk about. I have another friend of mine who said, I'm going to learn how to roll sushi. And I asked him the, the same question, like, why would you do that? And he goes, oh, I like sushi. I don't really know how to do it. And I bet you the women really like it. And they do. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, you know, it, it's all these little things, whether it's a language or, you know, a book that you're reading or the, the just, you know, being better, getting better is so powerful to the quality of life that you have. And those things do not cost money. 
These are these are things you need to invest your yourself into. You know, that so it's not about hey, I'm going to go buy the knowledge. You can't buy it. You can pay to learn, but you need to invest yourself to do it in all across the board. So um, I I went to school as a journalism major at the University of Florida. I was weeded out like most of my classmates by the fact that I didn't have the right punctuation and stuff like that. So it turned me off to writing, but I'm a creative and now I write freely. I'm putting out blogs and, you know, great content that people are out of nowhere contacting me and going, that's awesome stuff. And so there's an outlet for everybody and you just got to find your way. And, and the rewards are very different than we were brought up to believe. The rewards are internal. They make me feel better. This has nothing to do with money because I know tons of people who have a lot of money and are miserable. You really got to find your own stride. Steve, where can people connect with you or learn more about what you're uh, doing? So I made a commitment many, many years ago for my core business to be available on social media. So at Noodleberg is on, I'm on everything. I'm on Facebook, I'm on uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, of course, which, you know, one of the things I, t I train on is something called social selling. You need to be available. You need to put a piece of yourself out there. Um, and so I am completely open and transparent and available. Anybody that knows, uh, that follows me will know where in the world I am, who I'm working with, and they see the genuine feedback. So, uh, and I return all the emails myself. None of it is, uh, is done by anybody on my staff. I do all the emails, all the social, everything is mine uh, because I think it's the most genuine and authentic way to show up. And I know that if I can make an impact on somebody, I've made a commitment to do that. Excellent. We will put those, uh, all those links in the show notes so uh, our audience can uh, connect with you. Steve, this has been fun. Thanks a lot for the conversation today. It's my pleasure. You do a great job of, uh, of leading the, the conversation, and uh, I am very grateful and thankful that I had the opportunity. I love Steve's energy, enthusiasm, and perspective, and I took a bunch of notes. I hope that you found this episode helpful as well, whether you are a quote-unquote salesman or not. If you enjoyed this podcast, a very easy way that you can support it without spending any of your hard-earned dollars is to head over to iTunes and leave a five-star rating and a quick comment if you want. It's simple, it's easy, it's free. It's the best way to make sure that we are able to do this podcast and continue adding value to listeners like you each week. Thanks so much for doing this, and until next time, remember that success is a choice. What choice will you make today?